Well, hi, everybody. I am Colleen Evans. I am Director of Natural Sciences at the Staten Island Museum, and I am here today to talk to you a little bit about Elizabeth Britton and her mosses. So Elizabeth Britton was a bryologist, which is a fancy term, meaning that she studied mosses, um, and she lived in the late 1800s into the early 1900s. Um, so she was born Elizabeth Gertrude Knight in 1858. She was born here in New York City, uh, but pretty early in her life, her family moved to Cuba where they lived on her grandfather's property for quite a long time. And she cites that in her later life as what inspired her to start getting interested in the natural world and particularly mosses. Uh, she spent most of her childhood there, but they did eventually come back to New York City where she attended normal college and she was employed there afterwards where she taught botany. Her first kind of brush with fame within the scientific world was in 1879. She took a trip to Nova Scotia along with other people from the college where she rediscovered a population of the curly grass fern. So this particular fern was mostly known from New Jersey and similar areas in the mid-Atlantic. There was one thought to be erroneous uh, specimen that had been found in Newfoundland. Uh, but people thought that that was a mistake and that whoever it was that had collected it had just labeled it wrong. Uh, but she discovered that there was a population in Nova Scotia and actually later in life did dis discover a population in Newfoundland. So none of that was actually erroneous at all. Um, and this is the actual specimen that she had found. So the little one down at the right, uh, that is the specimen she picked up, uh, which was a very big deal at the time. Uh, it was written about by two different uh, prominent botanists, one of which was D.C. Eaton, so Daniel C. Eaton. Uh, he wrote it in the Bulletin of the Tory Botanical Club, and he wrote a little tiny little paragraph about how exciting it was that she had found it and congratulating her on her find. Um, anybody who works in botany might recognize D.C. Eaton. It was also, there was also a publication by Asa Gray, so A. Gray. Um, whenever you write a botanical name, you usually put the authorship next to them, and D.C. Eaton and A. Gray pop up quite often. Um, they were very prominent botanists during that time period. Um, and both were members of the Tory Botanical Society. So that was the earliest botanical society in the United States. It was founded in New York by students and colleagues of John Tory, who was a very, very prominent botanist, who strangely enough was still alive when they founded the society and named it after him. Um, that's usually a pretty unusual move, but uh, Elizabeth herself was nominated to the society in 1879. Uh, probably something to do with uh, that little discovery she made in Nova Scotia. Um, and that was a big deal to be nominated. Um, and my computer's trying to restart itself. Man, we're having a weird day. Okay. But yeah, so she was nominated to the society, which was a big deal. Because um, back in that time period, you did actually have to be nominated to scientific society. Somebody had to say that you belonged in it. You couldn't just join it yourself. Um, and she was also the first female editor of their publication, the Bulletin of the Tory Botanical Society. And she did that from 1886 to 1888. Uh, her first publications were also published through the society. So the first one she ever published was on albinism and some wildflowers, uh, but her first moss publication appeared there in 1883. And so this is the first time that she is showing any sort of interest in mosses that we know of. And that brings me to, but what is a moss? <laughs> So mosses are a type of plant. Um, like other plants, they photosynthesize. So they convert light carbon dioxide and water into energy and oxygen. Um, unlike other plants, what makes them unique is that they do not have vascular tissue. So vascular tissue is the tissues plants use, xylem and phloem, to transport nutrients throughout their body. So that's like the stringy bits in celery are that, as well as that's what allows things like trees and sunflowers and really tall plants to grow because they can transport nutrients from their roots up into the rest of the plant body. Uh, mosses don't have any of that. So that's why mosses tend to be very small, low to the ground and spready because they can't transport their nutrients particularly well. They have maybe some rudimentary tissues that can pull the nutrients around, but not a whole lot. Mosses also have this interesting two-phase life cycle. Uh, most of the time what you see in a moss is their gametophyte stage. So it's that low spready kind of leafy look that you usually see. But they also have the sporophyte stage, which is when there's like a little stalk that pops up with a big nodule at the top that's full of spores. So unlike other plants, mosses have spores. They don't have seeds. Seeds are basically like tiny little embryos. There's already some differentiated tissue for the plant to grow from. Spores are just basically a single cell that's eventually going to turn into a plant. Um, mosses can also reproduce via um, breaking apart. So if like a tiny bit of moss breaks apart, lands in a different place, oftentimes it can continue growing. Um, mosses also can occupy 
um, places most other plants can't because they don't have those different kinds of tissues. They don't have a root system or anything. So that's what allows them to grow. Like this is actually a picture I took at Snug Harbor. It's growing on a little bit of wood. Um, there's also, you know, mosses can grow like in the cracks of, you know, roof tiles. So that's on my shed. There's cracks in between uh, bricks and things like that. They're able to kind of occupy these little niches that other things can't. There's just one more example. That's me climbing up some rocks at the Tensionist Ruins in Georgia. Um, so way up at the top on top of this big ruin, there's like these teeny little mosses growing in these tiny pockets of water. Oh, and just another weird example of a moss growing in a place you don't expect. This is in the Mojave Desert. This is a recent discovery of little mosses hanging out underneath uh, bits of quartz. So like tiny little pieces of quartz. Um, if it had like the right refractory, so it was letting in just enough sunlight that it could photosynthesize, but not in too much that it was like creating a giant heat pocket. There were these tiny bits of mosses that could grow under there. I thought was very cute. They called them quartz parasols, which is very charming. Um, and so mosses are the first stage in primary succession. And so that is when a ha new habitat is being formed. So in places like lava flows, where you've got all this new rock and nothing growing on it, the first things you're going to find are usually mosses and lichens because they don't require soil to grow. And they're what's going to convert all those rocks and everything into soil eventually. It's so actually in this image, you can see kind of in the center there, there's another little shrubby thing finally growing up. So these are some lava fields um, in Iceland. And so this finally, over thousands and thousands of years, this will eventually become more heavily plant covered. Uh, but back to Elizabeth. So the late 1800s was the perfect time to start studying mosses, mainly because uh, microscopes were finally available to the general public. Um, prior to that, they were very expensive and most people did not have access to them. Um, and that also meant that things like mosses or other organisms that are very small and that you need to get a really good close look at um, just had not been studied very extensively. And so she was kind of diving into something that are part of science that nobody else had really done a whole lot of work in yet. And by the time she was in her mid 20s, she was considered one of the experts in mosses. Also in her mid 20s, uh, she met Nathaniel Lord Britton. So this is where her ties to the Staten Island Museum come in. So Nathaniel Lord Britton was one of the original uh, 14 who started the Natural Science Association of Staten Island, which eventually grew into being uh, what we are now, the Staten Island Museum. Uh, they met presumably through the Tory Botanical Club. He was nominated as a member in 1877. We don't actually know a whole lot about how they met, but that's what we assume. Um, and we do know that they were at least plant collecting together as of 1883. Um, so I've dug around in a couple different herbaria and at least in ours, the earliest examples I can find is 1883. And I found, I think that 1885 um, in the New York Botanical Gardens uh, collections. And so we have the earlier ones. We have actually quite a lot um, from their early courtship. And so they started appearing together in 1883. We, they were married in 1885. So actually this little plant here would have been the year they got married. Uh, so these are from May of 1885. They were married in August of that year. Uh, she was 27 years old. Um, and actually it was a bit controversial in the scientific community that she was getting married because it was assumed that she would become a housewife and a mother and therefore not be this wonderful scientist that she had been previously. This of course was not true. She and her husband both continued um, their scientific research throughout their marriage. Um, in 1888, they took a trip to Europe as many people in the time period did. And when they took a trip to London, they visited the Kew Royal Botanic Gardens and decided, you know what, that's really cool. Maybe we should have something similar in the United States, particularly in New York City. And so they came back and with the help of the Tory Botanical Society began raising funds and eventually founded the New York Botanic Garden. Uh, Nathaniel was the first director in chief. Um, and he was, took that position in 1896. And they both conducted research there throughout the rest of their lives. Um, Elizabeth was the curator of mosses throughout most of her life. There was a large herbarium that was brought there from the Columbia University, which they had brought with them. And they also continued their involvement with the Staten Island Museum. So she published a publication through our uh, proceedings in 1890, which is a list of all of the mosses found on Staten Island, or at least that she could find. Um, there were about eight or over a hundred species that she identified um, that were listed in that publication. And several years later, she actually had it a little addendum with a few more that she had found. And that is the core of our moss collection. So we have a decent sized moss collection. The vast majority is all collected by Elizabeth and was part of that work. Um, and all of it's in her handwriting, or at least most of it's so all that little like loopy handwriting. That's all stuff that was written by Elizabeth herself. 
Uh, she and Nathaniel continued their scientific work throughout their marriage. Uh, they mostly traveled through the Caribbean. Uh, Nathaniel published a lot of works of different uh, floral lists for the Caribbean. So places like Jamaica and Cuba and all these different places that they were visiting, they made these large uh, botanical listings. Uh, she was considered the foremost biologist in the early 20th century, and those who came after her were mostly trained by her. Uh, she was the only woman nominated to the, the Botanical Society of America when it was founded in 1893. Um, and she authored over 300 papers in her lifetime, many of which pertain to mosses, but also ferns. She was a big expert in ferns and wildflower preservation. Um, we actually have a lot uh, to thank her for in terms of protecting our native plants. So anybody who's like part of a native plant society, she's somebody that we should thank. Uh, she died of a stroke in February of 1934 at the age of 76, um, and then Nathaniel followed her soon afterwards in June of that year. And they're both buried in Moravian Cemetery here on Staten Island. Uh, the Moss Collection at New York Botanical Garden is named in her honor, um, and there's a plaque dedicated to her in their native plant garden. Uh, closer to home here on Staten Island, uh, a cottage that was owned by the Britons so that they inherited, uh, they actually donated here to the Staten Island Museum, which eventually transferred ownership of it to Richmond Town, where it is still on display. Uh, scientifically, she has 15 different species named after her and one genus. Um, my personal favorite is this one here, Ponthevia bretoniae. Um, it's called Mrs. Britton's uh, Shadow Witch is its common name, which sounds incredibly cool. Uh, turns out that all of the species in that genus are called shadow witches, so it's not, it's not a commentary on her. It's just a coincidence, but it still sounds pretty metal. Um, and then I want to just leave you with this little quote from another bryologist. Um, so he takes great pleasure in naming this distinct and beautiful species in honor of Mrs. Elizabeth G. Britton, whose careful work on American mosses is highly appreciated by biologists. Um, and before I take any questions, um, I just want to let you know that up next um, with the Staten Island Museum uh, on March 20th, so this Saturday, uh, we do have a super science coming out about biodiversity. And you can see yours truly talk about Mr. Davis's beetle box, um, which will be very cool. Uh, on April 15th is our next Lunch and Learn. That'll be with Audrey Malakowski. She's going to talk about Olive Earl and the natural world. Um, she's an illustrator uh, based here on Staten Island. And then on April 22nd is our Earth Day How-To Festival, which is also virtual. Um, and actually, I will be teaching you guys how to press a plant. So and that is it. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Colleen. Uh, we can open it up for Q&A. If anyone in the room has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself. Make yourself heard. Hi, this is Gabrielle. Um, thank you very much for this presentation. I was wondering, especially with the name change, uh, has it been difficult to track her works across um, different herbariums because of the name change? Or have you found that most systems have been well-maintained? And I'm laughing because I know that we have a system and it's not super well-maintained. Um, but I was just wondering if you could comment on uh, the challenges that come across when changing your name as someone that gets married and adopts a new name. So she's relatively easy to find just because she is pretty prominent in the botany world. So people pay attention, but you do have to search both for Elizabeth Knight and Elizabeth Britton usually. But where it gets confusing is at least like in our herbarium, most of the stuff we have collected by her is labeled as you know EGK, and searching that through a lot of data, databases gets really hairy. Um, and it was the same thing when I was trying to search some other databases for her. It's like, you're trying to use the initials because you know it might be listed that way, um, but then it's much harder to find her. Um, so yeah, so it is a bit of a challenge and it's because we know her maiden name, she's easier. I know there's a lot of female scientists where it gets a lot harder because we don't always know what their name was before they were married or what they changed their names to later. And so that's where it gets really hairy. Um, she's at least famous enough that people pay attention when they enter her into data, usually. That's a good question. Thank you. Also, uh, as uh, people that might be doing natural history collection, um, is there anything that you wish that people labeling things would do to help make name searches easier? That might not, that's that's kind of like a philosophical question. Yeah, about the no, well, don't just put your initials, right? 
like that would make my life a lot easier if people weren't using their initials all the time. Um, and that's a mostly an historical problem. Uh, I think people nowadays are a little bit better about that. And then also how you write your dates is a big problem. Um, I've entered a lot of data in my time working in collections and you sometimes have to really think about whether or not a person's writing a date the European way where you put date, month, year, as opposed to the American way where we decided for some reason that we're gonna put month, day, year and anything up to 12 is questionable, right? And so, yeah, I, I hate that personally. I usually, when I write dates, and this is true, like just throughout whenever I write a date is I put the day and I write like the first few letters of the month and then I put the year. Um, and then in some conventions actually use Roman numerals uh, for the month, which helps a lot. Uh, but yeah, that's another thing I wish people would do more often is just indicate how you're writing your dates, please and thank you. That's good questions. Thank you, Gabrielle. And thank you, Colleen Evans, for such a wonderful presentation. I, I always learn, even if it's in a passing conversation with you, Colleen. Um, and thank you for everyone for joining us. We hope you have a really good afternoon and we hope to see you at our next Lunch and Learn. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you, everyone. Welcome.